Good to see you today. I hope that, thanks Matt, I hope that we spend at least as much, if not much more time praying for our country uh, as we do celebrating it this week. Um, we are in desperate need, are we not? Uh, this nation needs a revival, and we have been praying that for many, many years. We're praying for revival. Um, and I know a lot of people want to link the political situation with that. I don't know that that will necessarily happen. It'd be nice. But what we're looking for is people to repent and receive Jesus as their personal Savior and follow Him. And um, Lord knows the, the, the country and the world will be a better place for that. So we're praying for our nation. Our text this morning is Psalm 27, the 27th Psalm in the book of Psalms. And uh, while you're finding that, I want to remind you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we are having communion together right after the service. And um, tomorrow uh, I start a, a mini sabbatical. I will be off for eight weeks. And I um, want you to know that uh, our deacons, Sergio and Jim, are your points of contact uh, during that time. Uh, they know my number, <laughs> should there be any emergency, um, but it will have to be an emergency. And um, we have uh, guest speakers lined up already. Uh, they include uh, good friends of ours, Ken Gilming. Uh, Brian McGrath, our very own uh, in-house, Ron Dardino, uh, Mike Bourne, and Pasquale Basta. So uh, we've, got, we've got everybody lined up, and uh, I trust that uh, you'll be here. Uh, I know how much you come to hear me. <laughs> but you know, every now and again, it, it's a good thing to hear from somebody else, okay? Do you remember when you were a kid? Well, yeah, when you were a kid. Yeah. I, I remember, I do. Um, do you remember playing Three Wishes? If you had three wishes, what would you wish for, right? The first one was always that all the rest of my wishes would be granted, wasn't it, right? And then you'd wish for, you know, back then, a lot of money was a million dollars. Today, it's more like a billion. Right? That would, be, that would be second. And then it was, you know, the, the sports cars or the this and the that. What if you only had one wish? That makes it a little harder. And, and no, you can't have, you can't wish for all your other wishes to come true. That's, that, I mean, that's just in the fine print of, of, the, of the wish thing. You can't have that. What if you had one wish? What would it be? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? King David, of course, the author of our psalm, was a shepherd. He was a skilled musician. He was a national hero, a, a man of war, a mighty man of war. It started when he was a teenager, right? Remember that whole Goliath thing? And then he's king over a nation. David had everything. When you really stop and think, David had everything. But he only had one wish. And what I want to preach to you today from our text here in Psalm 27 is, if you had one wish, would it be this? If you had one wish, would it be this? Follow along with me. Would you please, in Psalm 27, beginning in verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell, though an army may encamp against me. My heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me in this I will be confident. Now watch this, verse 4, here comes that one wish. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret place of His tabernacle He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in His tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Did you catch verse 4? David said, here is the one thing I ask of the Lord, the only, uh, the only thing I'm seeking, the thing I'm seeking most that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Sounds like the end of the 23rd Psalm, doesn't it? The word dwell, or do we have it up there? I think it's coming, yes. The word dwell means this. It means to live, to inhabit, and to stay. It means to be settled, to be inhabited. It means to set up, and by extension, it means to marry with the focus that the spouses live together. This is not a quick visit to church. Right? This isn't the quick in and out, right? We've got in and out burger today, we have in and out churches. This isn't the inconvenient obliga obligation, let's get it over with because I've got other things to do, religious duty, checklist, church. David loved the house of God. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart, but David was a man's man. And I want you to understand that this whole thing of, well, religion is for women and children, that's bunk. It is not. Church is important. And David loved the house of God. I remember in the religion I grew up in as a kid, I remember the can we just get this over with attitude, not just from kids, but from everybody who was there? We get in, we do our thing, we get out. David's not talking about that. I believe that religion has done more damage to church attendance, perhaps, than anything else. And today, when we want to invite people to church because we want them to hear the gospel and the word of God, people equate church with what they grew up with. And some people today, some adults today, have never been in a church except for a funeral or a wedding. We are in a post-Christian America. But I dare say that that mentality has had an impact on people who call themselves children of God. On people who profess faith in Jesus Christ. People who have, who have said, yes, I've received Christ as my Savior. They've gone through the baptismal water saying, I, I'm going to follow Jesus. Raised to walk with Him in newness of life. And somewhere along the way, they feel like, Church is no longer important. We've got that out of the way. Right? We, we got the religious duty, the religious obligation. And now, post-COVID, we have online church. Now, I'm just going to throw this out. Some of you have heard me say this at least once or twice. The word ecclesia. The Greek word ekklesia, which is translated church, means assembly. 
Literally, it means assembly. That is the definition of the word. So, online church really isn't church, is it? And when the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, like some are doing, but get together and, and, and encourage one another, and so much the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. By the way, do you see the day of the Lord approaching? Yeah. Oh, baby. Oh, yeah. And the Word of God says the best place to be, the only place to be, is assembled together during that time. And yet there are a whole bunch of people who say they're believers, who say they're followers of Jesus, who want to do church in their pajamas in front of the computer or TV screen. Now I understand that some people are shut in and can't get out. And there is a great privilege, opportunity for us. And I understand sometimes there's illness that prevents us from going to the house of God. Please, if you are hacking and yakking, please watch from home, all right? Don't need that. Don't need it here. But, but, dare we wish, would we wish what David wished? That I can dwell that I can hunker down, that I can stay, settle into the house of God all the days of my life. David didn't want to leave. He had to, obviously. He had things to do as king. But David loved the house of God. Why was God's house so precious to David? And why did he want to be there as often as possible? In the verses we've read together, I find David giving us four reasons. The first one we found in verse 4, when he says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord. If church is nothing more than a religious duty and an obligation to you, you're missing the whole point. And I have to say, you're probably not hearing me. <laughs> David said, I'm going, I want to go to the tabernacle, the, the tent. Remember, the temple was built under Solomon, David's son. So I, I I want the tabernacle. This is a big tent. But David said, this is the house of God. And I want to go there to gaze upon his beauty, to delight in his perfections. He wanted to go to the house of God because he knew that that was the place he could be closest to God and delight most in God. And folks, listen, when, when we get together and you sit in, 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 in an adult class with, with Ron and he expounds the scriptures and, and Paskey right now with the teenagers and the Sunday school classes for the kids, they're learning about the beauty and the perfections of God. And I know there are some theological things that get debated in the, in the, other, in the uh, adult class and so on, but you know what? That's all part of the picture. That's all part of it. What we're supposed to keep our eyes on, right? The Bible says, fix your eyes upon Him. And by the way, let me just say that sometimes these theological discussions divide us. And if they do, that's wrong. That's wrong. Period. And if the theological discussion is dividing us, then chances are it's wrong. Or the way we're presenting it is wrong. I love theology. I love to... I, I remember coffee shop theology. That's what we called it back in Bible college. In between classes, standing around the coffee machine with all these wannabe preachers talking about the deep things of theology. And most of them, you know what I think God thinks about it? I think one day we're going we're to stand before God and He's going to go, 
Really? That? Come on. There are so much more important things. And how about reveling in the beauty and the perfections of God himself? Man, I'll tell you what, we get all hung up on a bunch of different things instead of just enjoying God. I want to read to you a few verses. His glory is incomprehensible. Moses said to God in in Exodus chapter 33, he said, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. God said, can't do it. He said, you cannot look upon my face, for no man shall see me and live. But in his grace and in his mercy, he said, I'm going to hide you over here in this little cleft of the rock. And I'm going to cover your eyes, and I'm going to pass by, and after I pass by, you'll get to see some of the sparkle. That's kind of my interpretation of the glory of God. Because that's all we can handle as human beings. You know what that says to me? That someday, when I finally get to see God, in this transformed body. My socks are going to get blown off. God is unbelievable. Incredible. And if we try putting Him into our box, well, first of all, He'll always break out. But if we try putting God into our box, we're going to be on the wrong side of a lot of things. His glory is incomprehensible. His understanding is incomparable. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5. He counts the number of the stars. All of them. We don't know how many there are. We don't know where it ends. He counts the number of the stars and he calls them all by name. Come on. What? God has named every star. He's got a name. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I just think that's so cool. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. His power is immeasurable. Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 10, 12. He has made the earth by His power. He has established the world by His wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at His discretion. I like that. Again, don't try to put God in your box. He won't fit. So David said, I want to be in the house of God to see the beauty of the Lord. The second reason he wanted to dwell in the house of the Lord is found in verses 4 and 5 where it says, uh, and to inquire in his temple for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me and he shall set me high upon a rock. To seek help from the Lord. Anybody here ever feel like you need help from God? Today? (laughs) Oh yeah. That old hymn, I need thee every hour. Sometimes I tell the Lord I need you more than that. How about every minute? And David said, I want to be in the house of God, not only to see the beauty of the Lord, but also to seek help from the Lord. Listen, what better place to come together and to pray together? Plug for our Thursday night prayer meeting. Plug for our life groups, which are right now off for the summer, but our life groups, 
We spend time praying together, taking prayer requests. But to seek help from the Lord together. Together. What am I asking for help for? Well, for guidance. You think King David felt like he had everything under control all the time? Like he had it all wrapped up? No. He needed guidance from God. And, and, and so he says, he'll hide me in his pavilion. How about for courage? He'll set me high upon a rock. And how about for assurance? He will lift my head in honor, he went on to say. I don't know about you, but those are just a few of the things I need from God. Sometimes, I just need strength for the day. I was down in the children's wing the other day and just looking at some things. I was in the nursery and there's this little pouch hanging up next to the door on the nursery that I had never seen before. And on it, it said something like, do one thing every day that scares you. So I told Bobby Joe, I said, hey, I saw that little thing there, and I quoted it to her, and I said, uh, I do that every day, by the way. I do one thing every day that scares me. I get out of bed. <laughs> Man, I need the Lord. I need the Lord. And I know I can pray at home, and I do. I pray in my vehicle, especially driving around Boston, right? I pray all the time, but man, to be with God's people in the house of God, praying for the help of God is so, so important. 1 Chronicles 16, verses 10 and 11 says, Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face evermore. David said, when you said, seek my face, my heart said, I'll seek you. I'll seek you. Seek God. You know what that means? You know what hide and seek is, right? Now, God isn't hiding himself from us. He's hidden from our fleshly nature, from our humanity. But when we seek him in prayer, when we seek him in his word, he promised that he would reward those who seek him diligently. Those who diligently seek him, he said, I will reward. I don't know about you, but I haven't learned everything there is to know about God. I haven't even learned everything there is to know about myself. And God keeps showing that to me, and in that, he shows me himself. But I'll tell you what I do know about God. I know what the Word of God says, and, and, and I believe it all, and I know about God's mercy and His patience and His compassion and His love. His goodness as my Heavenly Father. And sometimes that gets me out of bed and gets me through a day and gets me back into church. You see what I'm saying? And when we get together and we ponder these things and we, we focus on these things, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord. So he said, I want to dwell in the house of God all the days of my life to see the beauty of the Lord, to seek help from the Lord. And third, to give offerings to the Lord. Sacrifices. Now I want to throw this out to you very quickly because some people get all, when they, when they you know, animal sacrifices and so on and so forth, and, and I, you know, I understand to a certain degree. Why did they have to sacrifice animals back then? Now let me, I'm going to interrupt myself and just say this. That was until the cross when Jesus died as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
who shed his blood. And what those before the cross were supposed to do in sacrificing animals as a covering for sin, never take, took away sin, it just covered sin, it, they were supposed to recognize the horror of sin and what it did and what it causes. Death. But then there was the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And the blood was supposed to give life and show them that there's life in the blood. And there was sprinkling of the blood. Say, oh, that's gross. Because sin corrupted everything and broke it and made us unworthy of standing before God, but God didn't want it to stay that way. And so he told them, you look by faith to the one that these sacrifices picture. The, the author of the book of Hebrews says that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But Jesus sacrificed himself and offered himself once for all as a sacrifice for sin. And so they were supposed to be looking forward, and I'm just going to give you a real quick, this is, this is bare bones theology, but all of those who truly looked ahead by faith to the, to the anointed one who was to come, and they were putting their faith in him and the promises of God, when they died, they went to a place Jesus called Abraham's bosom in Luke 16, or paradise. Why? Why didn't they just go to heaven? Because Jesus hadn't paid the sacrifice for sin yet. He hadn't shed his blood. When he did, they were ushered into heaven, and now we, on this side of the cross, need to look back by faith and recognize and receive him right, as our atonement for sin, as the one who paid our penalty, our cost, and did it all for us, not trusting in our religion or religious works, but in his finished work on the cross. Saying, Jesus, I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve the mercy of God. But thank you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking my place. Forgive me for my sins. Come into my life and be my Savior. Guess what? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I know, I know, not based on my good works, not based on my good looks. Whew. What a relief. I know because back in 1978, I prayed and asked Christ to come into my life. Just like the book says. And I know if that happened, if today, boom, God takes me, I'll be with him. I'll be with him. That's what he says. That's what he says. And so I got a little off not off track, but I just wanted to get, uh, kind of get uh, this in your mind, right? This might, might even be a good bumper sticker. <laughs> Sacrifices require sacrifice. What? Profound, right? Sacrifices require sacrifice. You didn't just grab any old lamb to offer to God, not according to the Mosaic Law. It had to be the best of the best. And now on this side of the cross, we don't have to offer those sacrifices, but because of the sacrifice offered for us, God says, I want to prove the sincerity of your love. And we're told many times in the New Testament that we are supposed to give whether it's of our time, of our talents, or our treasure. Not that God needs any of them, and He especially doesn't need our money, but you know what? He's, he wants us 
He's testing, should I say, our hearts. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is, Jesus said. And for those who can't let go of their treasure, that shows where their heart is. And it's not with God. You see how that works? Because if I'm trusting God, I can give hilariously because God loves a cheerful giver, right? That's what the word cheerful means there in 1 Corinthians. Gives with hilarity. By the way, I want you to notice here when David says, uh, um, he says, Going, and now my head shall be lifted up above my uh, enemies, therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle, literally with shouts of joy. Man, would I love to hear people run into the offering box going, Wahoo! <laughs> yeah! Boom. I know most people give online anymore, but you can email a Yahoo. <laughs> Willingly and joyfully. Why? Because he gave everything for us. And because he promised that he is our source. Not your job, not your inheritance, nothing. Nothing else. He is your source. Well, there's one more thing that David, and one more reason David says he wanted to dwell in the house of God. It's to see the beauty of the Lord. It's to seek help from the Lord. It's to give offerings to the Lord. And then it's to sing praises to the Lord. In verse 6, we read this. <clears throat> After he says, therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle, I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. <laughs> I want you to understand something. The Bible teaches us that all creation sings to God. Let me read to you quickly. Let me read to you Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise Him all His hosts. Praise Him sun and moon and all you stars of light. Praise Him you heavens of heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for He commanded and they were created. He also established them forever and ever and He made a decree which shall never pass away. Praise the Lord from, from the earth. Listen, you great sea creatures and all the depths. Anybody ever hear a whale sing? Just saying. I'm actually going to come back to that in a second. Fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling His word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and He has exalted the horn of His people, the strength of His people, the praise of all His saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to Him. Praise the Lord. Now let me just share this with you. The word praise means to give thanks, to cheer, to extol. And it's the combination of two Hebrew words. One is halal, and the other is yah, the name of God. From which we get, we sang it multiple times this morning, hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. And did you notice that the psalmist said, he, he's, praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you stars. Listen to this. Elizabeth Landau, who is a communications person for NASA, was, was writing uh, regarding NASA's 
uh, exoplanet exploration program about something called astero seismology. Now, I want you to understand something. I do not camp out in these websites. That, that's just like, okay. Astero seismology, scientists have found that there are seismic events in all of the planets and all of the stars, just like here on Earth. And they can hear them. And they all make different sounds. Listen to what she wrote. She wrote this. Uh, um, we can't hear it with our ears, but the stars in the sky are performing a concert, one that never stops. The biggest stars make the lowest, deepest sounds like tubas and double basses. Small stars have high-pitched voices like celestial flutes. These virtuosos don't play one note at a time either. Our own sun has thousands of different sound waves bouncing around inside of it at any given moment. I guess the heavens do declare the glory of God, don't they? And when the psalmist said, sing sun and moon, sing all you stars, they're saying we are. And they're singing praises to God. I, I wonder if we're going to get to hear that someday. Not only, can, you, can you imagine, this is God and His orchestra and His choir all the stars and all the planets with all the creatures under the sea. And it says here trees and mountains. And then we get to chime in. Wow! Wow! Matt, would you like to be leading that? <laughs> Listen. All creation praises Him, and we were made to praise Him. And when we do, it's to our benefit. It's to our benefit. Paul wrote this in Colossians 3, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, to the Lord. You get that? We're singing to the Lord psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and guess what? They're ministering to us. They're teaching us, sometimes admonishing us. Why should I be in church? Come and sing praises to the Lord and grow spiritually by it. You and everybody around you. David remembered his years in exile running from Saul and his separation from the tabernacle. And I know he missed it. And because David highly valued God, he highly valued God's house. I want to say that again. Because David highly valued God, he highly valued God's house. And he highly valued all the time he could spend in it. I wonder how many have purchased a certain brand of pain relief products because a famous actor slash paid spokesperson said, trust me, you need this. Then I wonder why so many Christians are foregoing the benefits of assembling together in church. Even when its divine founder says, trust me, you need this. The local church is the only place called the pillar and ground of truth. It's the only place where the New Testament's one another's can be fulfilled, bear one another's burdens, uh, encourage one another, pray for one another, teach one another, serve one another, Etc., etc. It's the only place identified by Jesus where believers are to humbly resolve their misunderstandings and settle their disagreements. Matthew 18. And it's the only place 
Christians are commanded to assemble with regularity and not forsake. If your one wish isn't the same as David's, I encourage you today, I, I strongly encourage you today, ask God to change your heart. And He will oblige. Because He wants His house to be as important to you as it is to Him. So come back to church. At home, come back to church. And behold the Lord's beauty. Seek the Lord's help. Give the Lord offerings. And sing the Lord praises. Trust me, you need this. The beauty of the Lord's mercy, grace, compassion, and love are found in the cross. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that, on that cross, and in that sacrifice, that act of love is salvation. Faith in the finished work and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know Him as your Savior? Have you ever prayed and asked Christ to come into your life to save you from your sin? If you never have, I want to offer you that opportunity right now. Just with a silent prayer where you're seated, praying unto God, just say these words, Dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you for the beauty of your compassion and your mercy. Thank you for the cross. And Lord Jesus, thank you for going there for me. Please come into my life right now. I want to trust you and you alone for my salvation, my forgiveness, my eternal life, my all. And I do this in your precious name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want to speak, of course, to everybody here, but I want to speak specifically to you at home. Maybe today's the day you promised the Lord to renew your love for and your commitment to the local church. And let me say very clearly, a local church that teaches and preaches the Word of God like you just heard it. Not a place where you run in, spend a few minutes, and then run out but a place where you get together with God's people, around God's word, in prayer to God, in rejoicing about God and in God. You need this. Jesus said so. I wonder today, for those here, maybe a show of hands would say, Uh, Pastor, pray for me. I want the Lord to instill in me a greater love for and commitment to His house. Pray for me, Pastor. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank You that as we look to the cross with great joy and the anticipation of being able to spend eternity with You, You have given us a place here on earth until that time to gather together with one another and to behold your glory and Lord to love one another and encourage one another as the day approaches Father please help us to understand how much you love your house how much you love the local church Jesus loved it and gave himself for it the Bible says And Father, may we do the same. I pray it today. And for all those who raise their hands, in Jesus' name, amen.